Our next speaker is going to be a Skype call. Uh, his name is Chris Birchfield. Uh, he is from the National Weather Service in Brownsville, Texas. He graduated from Ohio State in 2013 with a BS in Atmospheric Science and was a student volunteer at the National Weather Service in Baltimore. Chris, has, Chris will be presenting oh, remotely <laughs> from Brownsville this afternoon. Please welcome Chris. here to all of you guys on my very unique experience being involved with three major hurricanes, two of which I personally worked through and then one of them I assisted with um, after in the wake of Maria. So here's a presentation overview. I'm going to do a brief overview of the 2017 hurricane season, also do a brief timeline of Harvey, Irma, and Maria, and then discuss uh, what tropical operations are like in the Weather Forecast Office in the National Weather Service. And then I'm going more detail on my experience working through Harvey, Irma, and Puerto Rico on a deployment, and then also my deployment to Miami, working to backup operations on um, San Juan. So here's an overview of the 2017 season. I'm sure all of you know it was pretty active. We did have 17 named storms. Six of those ended up being major hurricanes, many of them impacting the U.S. coastline. These are the paths that I've plotted of the three hurricanes that I'll be talking about. There's Brownsville all the way in South Texas for those that don't know where it is. Um, that's my home office here. Um, Harvey developed in the Central Atlantic and developed into a tropical storm and then eventually weakened in the Caribbean Sea and then moved over the Yucatan Peninsula, redeveloping and then rapidly intensifying upon landfall in the Middle Texas coast. Um, I was here at my office working through Harvey and then shortly after that, Irma developed and became another major hurricane and affected the San Juan area, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and other of the Caribbean islands and the Leeward Islands. Um, that eventually continued westward and made landfall as a major hurricane in the Florida Keys and moved up the coast of Florida. Then we had Maria right after that, which unfortunately made landfall directly over the island of Puerto Rico, doing catastrophic damage to that area, moving northward and then eventually curving out to sea. <coughs> So just a recap of the Saffir uh, Simpson hurricane wind scale, as I'll be talking a lot about categories. Major hurricane uh, status is at three, four, and five, all of which will do de devastating and catastrophic damage upon impact. And here's a timeline of Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Harvey developed on August 17th, continuing on through September 1st. We had full tropical operations here at the Brownsville office. Despite the eye moving uh, north of our area and making landfall in Corpus Christi's area of responsibility, we had many impacts here and were in full tropical operations during that, as it made landfall as a Category 4. Uh, devastating damage occurred to the middle and upper Texas coast, and as you know, catastrophic flooding all over the Houston area as a result, as it meandered over the area. 
And shortly after that, only about a week, Irma um, posed a threat towards the Puerto Rican islands. I was then deployed to NWS San Juan, Puerto Rico on September 4th, just about a week after working Harvey. Catastrophic impacts affected the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is also port, uh, part of the San Juan area forecast, I'm sorry, county warning area and that National Weather Service office. Puerto Rico took just a glancing blow as the Category 5 moved by on September 6th with my widespread minor damage reports over the main islands. And even though Puerto Rico took a glancing blow of that one, unfortunately took a direct impact from Maria as landfall occurred right over the <coughs> southeast portion of the island and affected some of the same areas that were affected by Irma after that. I was then deployed to NWS Miami to perform backup operations for San Juan as their communication uh, had failed and none of their forecasts were able to be transmitted. So this is a little bit of what we do during tropical operations. Staffing, uh, we immediately go to 12-hour operations, 12-hour uh, rotations, I'm sorry. Uh, we have management, obviously, which oversees pretty much the whole event. And then we even have an event coordinator throughout operations to make sure everything runs smoothly, we're consistent, et cetera. Uh, if if uh, staffing is sufficient, we will have somebody doing the, the forecast grids. We'll have somebody doing the aviation, the hazards, including, say, uh, hurricane warnings, storm surge warnings, et cetera. And we may have one or two warning forecasters to look for the potential for water spouts or tornadoes. And then also we'll have somebody doing decision support, working with emergency management and uh, the local media markets. In addition to that, we'll have public service meteorologists, which handle some of the social media, some of the short-term products, and also uh, release some of our special weather balloons. So now I will start with Hurricane Harvey, which affected portions of the middle Texas coast. It developed as a tropical storm east of the Leeward Islands. This is actually uh, before it became a tropical storm, the NHC was able to issue potential tropical cyclone advisories for the Leeward Islands here, which gave them extra lead time. And then it weakened as it moved into the Caribbean Sea and then slowly moved towards the Yucatan and then uh, redeveloped over the uh, Bay of Campeche as a tropical storm and then quickly developed into a hurricane and into a major hurricane by the time it made landfall on August 25th. And it only made it from the middle Texas coast to Louisiana in five days, unfortunately producing uh, lots of rainfall over the Houston area. Here's a close-up of the path of Harvey. As it moved by our area, thankfully for us, um, it was 110 miles per hour sustained winds just off of our shore. Uh, we did have some minor impacts along the coast here, but fortunately it moved north of our area and unfortunately affected some of the areas here in the middle Texas coast, just north of Corpus Christi. It became a Category 4 hurricane upon landfall with sustained winds of 130. And then once it made landfall, weak steering flow allowed for Harvey to meander right over the same areas, producing tons of rain over the Houston area, and eventually making landfall on the 30th in the Louisiana coastline. Here's a five-day forecast track from the NHC. As you can see here, this was actually a potential tropical cycle 9, not even named Harvey yet and that allowed them to issue tropical storm warnings over the Leeward Islands to give them extra lead time. As Harvey moved westward, it eventually weakened with a lot of storm or wind shear and dry air, inhibiting its growth. And that was on August 19th. And as it continued to move westward, I actually was not at our home office uh, leading up to this event. I was in Wyoming on a vacation uh, for the eclipse and then also in Colorado on the 23rd, obviously monitoring all of the, the forecasts as um, major impacts could potentially uh, affect my area. So I decided, uh, I actually went back a day early with my friend and I uh, as trop or hurricane watches were being issued for our area and the middle Texas coast. I eventually came back on August 24th. This is a picture from 23rd as Harvey um, became a tropical depression and then quickly became a, a hurricane as it moved towards the northwest. And there you see hurricane warnings being issued. And already, if, if it, it's kind of hard to see, but the five-day five day cone of uncertainty is pretty much the whole area as the NHC was picking up already on the weak steering flow and the expected uh, stationary movement of Harvey. And then as it moved towards the northwest, came a hurricane and eventually a major hurricane upon landfall and expected uh, movement was not really there. Um, it would continue to meander over the Houston area and eventually move off towards the Louisiana coast. 
So here's a picture of the Brownsville operations. This is my workstation here. Um, for those that haven't been in the weather forecast office, several of our workstations um, have multiple monitors. We actually have 27 inch monitors now, two on the PC side and two on AWIP side, which is where we do our forecasts. Here I have aviation, radar, satellite, and tons of other data here on the side. Uh, I was helping with social media here and also had a, another iPad here for additional images. And in the background, it's one of our lead forecasters, Mike Castillo, doing a Spanish interview live as Harvey was moving by. We also have a media room in the back part of the operations area, but a lot of the media outlets like to uh, do their interviews right in the middle of the action. And here on the right, we have a, a picture of one of our special balloon releases during Harvey. Now, what was I doing? Obviously, I wasn't here leading up to much of the event, but I arrived and then worked a 12-hour shift the day as it was moving uh, by our area. Um, I was a morning forecaster early on in the event. Um, being on the western side, we didn't have a whole lot of potential for water spouts or tornadoes, but we did have a couple uh, couplets moving onshore. Ended up not issuing any warnings, but we did have a special weather statement out for some of the onset of the really strong winds that were moving along the coast. Later on, as the eye moved to, towards the northwest, I helped out with the hazards, which included collaborating with the National Hurricane Center, Corpus Christi office, and some of the other centers to make sure that we have a consistent message as Irma was moving by, or I'm sorry, Harvey was moving by. And here is a really cool loop of Harvey. Um, this is the GO-16 visible imagery. The, sun's, the sun was setting right as Harvey was making landfall, but as you can see, uh, one minute imagery provided really good detail right in the middle of the eye of Harvey. And here's a closer up view um, as it was making landfall. Great detail right in the middle as uh, GO-16 provided additional resolution spatially and temporally. Here's a couple damage pictures. Uh, unfortunately, I, can't, I don't have a lot of time to show a lot of these, but here's just an example of some of the damage where it made landfall. Uh, right near Port Ranzas, which is north of Corpus Christi. And here's a rainfall map. This is one of those maps that didn't have uh, anything greater than 25 inches, um, unfortunately, but some of the areas in Houston received up to 60 inches. But um, in our area, we actually didn't have much rain. Some areas didn't receive any rain at all, despite the eye moving just north of us. Even in the Brownsville area, we only had up to an inch of rain. And to cap off Harvey, here are a few uh, facts um, first landfall was on 20, August 25th, max sustained winds at 130 miles per hour. This is from the NHC's final assessment, so these data should be final, I believe. The second landfall, as there was a barrier island right there, a little bit uh, weaker at 120 miles per hour. Highest observed sustained wind, 110 with a wind gust of 145. There was some storm surge um, to the northeast of the center, up to 10 feet above ground level of inundation affected much of the middle Texas coast north of Corpus Christi. Um, obviously, catastrophic flooding damage occurred over Houston. That's where most of the deaths occurred. Um, the storm total rainfall, the highest amount recorded was 60.58 inches, which was an all-time record for a tropical cyclone. The previous record was 52 inches in Hawaii in 1950, and the continental record was 48 inches in Medina, Texas in 1978. And to put that in perspective, 48 inches was the previous record, and over 18 locations picked up 48 inches in this event. Tornadoes were also a concern, 57 preliminarily reported, with over 100 tornado warnings issued by the Houston office. There were 68 directly linked deaths, which became the deadliest hurricane since Sandy. Uh, miraculously, though, none of those deaths were because of storm surge, which is very rare. Most of them were due to freshwater flooding. So now I will talk about Hurricane Irma, which impacted U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So just five days later after landfall, um, Irma became a tropical storm. And then two days later was a uh, major hurricane on, on September 1st. And that continued and basically held its strength, especially after September 3rd, where it was a major hurricane, all the way through September 10th when it made landfall in Florida. Here's a closer up view as Irma was moving by. This is a view of Puerto Rico. The eye went just to the north of the U.S. Virgin Islands. However, the eye wall went right over the U.S. Virgin Islands and did catastrophic damage there, and also went right over the island of St. Martin, which is uh, one of the islands that the <coughs> San Juan office actually issues an aviation forecast for, for, despite being out of the U.S. So as Irma Dubai had sustained winds at 185 miles per hour preliminarily and continued on to the northwest, 
and did minimal damage to Puerto Rico. And um, luckily, they took a glancing blow. It obviously, could have been much worse if it had taken a westward track. And here is the first five-day cone from the NHD, Tropical Storm Irma. This is on the 30th, so five days after I worked uh, Harvey. And this is on Sunday. Obviously, as you can see, San Juan and Puerto Rico is in the cone of uncertainty there with possible major hurricane at that time on, um, later in the week. So this is on Sunday. Uh, on Friday, just a couple days before, my meteorologist in charge informed me that they were potentially wanting to send me to Puerto Rico. And um, on, I'm sorry, on Sunday, yeah, this is when it was determined that I would be going to Puerto Rico. Uh, and I left on Monday, just the day later. So as Irma was moving by, hurricane warnings obviously issued for much of the Caribbean, the Northern Caribbean islands, and then the Bahamas. And a lot of you probably remember this image when uh, those in Florida began to panic as there was a potential for a major hurricane in their area. Continued westward and actually took a further west track and affected directly the, the Florida Keys and going right up the western coast of Florida. So now I would be deploying to Puerto Rico um, on September 4th, just to rewind back before Irma moved by. Uh, landed in San Juan, beautiful landscape, beautiful view of uh, the high terrain as I was landing just a couple days before Irma would potentially be impacting. And remember, we were actually in the cone of uncertainty still, so you know, me being um, deploying to Puerto Rico had a little bit of fear there. Um, here's the view south of my hotel in Isla Verde, which is on the north coast of Puerto Rico. Uh, this is the evening when I landed. I would be working the next day. Um, Irma had become the strongest hurricane ever in the Atlantic Basin outside of the Caribbean and the Gulf, and also received this emergency alert on my phone, which was a little bit unnerving as things were about to get really busy. The next day, I went in for my first shift. Here is a uh, morning coordination meteorologist in San Juan watching the, the press conference on TV with meteorologists in charge there, standing right next to the Puerto Rican governor. So as you can imagine, things became really busy right when I arrived. Uh, didn't really settle in at all, just got right to it. Here's a picture of the official aviation forecast for the St. Martin Airport on the Dutch side. This is one of the points that we were responsible for. Um, right here in this line, I know it's in knots, but I converted it over here. Sustained winds were forecast at 160 with gusts to 185 directly for that airport from 3 to 7 a.m. And here is a picture after Irma had moved directly over Barbuda and was moving northwestward near the island of St. Martin. And obviously, Puerto Rico looks uh, very small compared to this large uh, hurricane. So I, you know, it's a bit. There's also a bit unnerving seeing this on infrared satellite, not even at a latitude yet. Here's a picture of San Juan operations right in the middle of a NHC conference call. There's the MIC right there. And over here is Orlando Bermudez in the foreground. He was also deployed from Austin, San Antonio, and then Patricia back here from Fort Worth. And we had one other person not pictured from uh, New Orleans office. But as you can see, we were huddled around for the conference call as a busy day was about to be unfolding as the eye neared the northeast coast of Puerto Rico. This is a picture of my workstation. Uh, many monitors, again, um, had many tasks, but primarily uh, most of the time was taken up translating products that's one of the reasons why I was sent there due to my Spanish language experience. I had to translate numerous NWS products, including the National Hurricane Center advisories, which was every three hours. Uh, also updated graphics and sent them to social media and to partner emails for emergency management. And then also helped out with weather balloons every, every six hours. And it's a lot of frantic calls from the public, mostly in Spanish. And then eventually what input a lot of storm reports and assist with damage surveys. And here in the picture, you can barely see, but there's a cot right there. A lot of the office ended up staying there uh, for a couple days as uh, conditions deteriorated, and they're away from their family. Here's a picture of the radar image uh, from my phone relative to my position here. Uh, the eye wall was moving right over the U.S. Virgin Islands, including St. John and St. Thomas, which is part of their area. And as that eye wall was moving overhead, the San Juan office issued a rare extreme wind warning for winds of 115 miles per hour or greater. These are basically issued as a last ditch effort to get people to safety as life threatening impacts were imminent. And I believe this was the third one at the time issued, um, right after the one that was issued for Harvey in Corpus Christi's area. So here's a picture as the winds were picking up to near uh, Hurricane Force. We had a piece of uh, roof peeling off. 
we also had a palm tree fall in our um, over our entrance early on in the event, which was tropical storm force uh, sustained winds. And then here's a little video that I have. Hopefully that'll play there. Just a brief video showing the winds before it's replaced. And here's an image comparison of radar and satellite. Obviously, we got very lucky as the eye was just offshore. If one of these bands had moved over the coast, we easily could have had way more impacts than we than we saw. Um, and moving on, here is uh, one of those products that I had to issue for the National Hurricane Center as Irma's eye was moving by. On the left is the National Hurricane Center's advisory, and as immediately as that comes in, we start translating into Spanish over here and then retransmit it so that some of the offices along the Florida coast can use it, as well as the National Hurricane Center and some of the media. And here's some of the damage as Irma moved by, one of the famous mango trees at the office had toppled over and other uh, uprooted trees around the property, and that's the palm tree that uh, blocked our entrance on the way in. And hopefully this place too, this is a pretty cool uh, radar loop as Irma was moving by. Uh, that right there, it's over the U.S. Virgin Islands and moving towards Culebra, which is an island of Puerto Rico. Did a lot of damage there. And then eventually moved off to the northwest. Didn't have a whole lot of impacts on the southern coast of Puerto Rico, as you'd expect, but um, um, quite a bit of impacts along the northern coast and actually still a lot of damage despite no direct uh, landfall. Another cool opportunity that I had, I um, actually had to do two phone interviews after a midnight shift of 12 to 14 hours with one of my friends, Andrew Michael from Channel 6, and then also Mike Joyce from Dayton, Ohio, two of which um, I know through Ohio State. So I thought that was a really cool opportunity. And unfortunately, as we were trying to settle down um, after Irma, Hurricane Jose had developed right in the wake of Irma and uh, was threatening some of the same islands that were impacted directly by Irma. It's probably hard to see, but we had tropical storm watches out for the U.S. Virgin Islands, which resulted in us having to go back on the 12-hour shifts for Irma, which meant more midnight shifts for me and not able to really settle down after Irma. Uh, but eventually, uh, Jose ended up taking a more northern uh, track instead of westward, so we were able to let those go, and we were back to routine operations. Here's a picture of Patricia from the Dallas-Fort Worth office issuing special, or releasing another special weather balloon. We continued to do special releases even after Irma had moved by for Jose and Irma. Um, as I was trying to settle down, I was supposed to be leaving the island, going back to Brownsville, as Irma was expected to impact South Florida, and we actually became one of the potential backup sites for Miami. Uh, so I was trying to rush back, but unfortunately all my flights were canceled, San Juan Airport was closed, and um, the, I was flying through Miami, unfortunately, so I was canceled for several days. So that meant that I would be staying even longer, several days, so I helped input some of the data from the post-storm damage reports. And just this municipality alone had $2 million in damage from Irma, despite no direct landfall. So some of the Irma statistics, um, it was the longest any cyclone around the globe has maintained 185 miles per hour on record, which was 37 hours at 185. The previous record was uh, 24 hours in the Northwest Pacific. It also was a Category 5 hurricane for over three days and became the strongest on record to impact the Leeward Islands. It had a minimum pressure preliminarily of 914 millibars and did $109 million in damage to Puerto Rico alone despite no direct landfall, which is pretty amazing. <clears throat> so that was it for Irma. Now moving on to Hurricane Maria, just two weeks later after Irma moved by Puerto Rico, developed on September 16th to a tropical storm Moved to the northwest and became a major hurricane upon landfall directly over Puerto Rico over the overnight of September 20th. Eventually moved to the northwest, threatened some of the coastline of North Carolina as a hurricane, and then eventually curved out to sea on September 30th and then weakened. Here's a close-up of Maria moving right over Puerto Rico. It was slightly weaker than Irma and even weakened before landfall, thankfully, but still did catastrophic damage to the island of St. Croix, which is part of the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the island of Vieques, and then obviously Puerto Rico as it moved overhead. It had estimated winds over 140 miles per hour as it moved over Puerto Rico, and eventually weakened slightly and became a major hurricane again right after um, re-intensifying. So just uh, for interest's sake, here's a plot of Irma from before, and then Maria right after that. So two major hurricanes went right through their, their county warning area. 
Here's a forecast cone for potential tropical cyclone 15. So this um, allowed them to issue tropical storm watches for the Leeward Islands again. So this uh, product actually ended up very useful by the end of the tropical season. Continued west northwestward, hurricane watch is issued for Puerto Rico, moved directly overhead, and then continued northward, and then eventually curved out towards Europe. Here's a, an image of the infrared satellite from GO-16 as Maria was making landfall directly over the island of Dominica. If you can't see the island, that's because the eye is taking up the entire island, unfortunately, and did major damage there. As it moved northwestward, Barely noticeable, but that's the island of St. Croix. Took major damage right in the eyewall of Maria as it moved northwestward. And then Maria eventually made landfall late in the night, which um, allowed them to issue another extreme wind warning for 115 mile per hour or greater sustained winds. Here is an image of the radar and, or the reflectivity and velocity of the radar, which was destroyed by Maria. Um, the last image was around 5 a.m. before, like right as it was making landfall actually, uh, so they lost radar coverage from that radar through the entire event after that. And still to this day, the radar is destroyed, and they have no radar coverage from that particular radar. These are the estimated peak wind gusts as it moved overhead. It's probably difficult to see here, but uh, a lot of the power plants plotted here are right in the path of Maria on, in most of the populated areas. So unfortunately knocked out lots of power to most of the island, at one point based virtually 100%. And to this day, there's still a lot of people without power several months later. And obviously, like I said, NWS communications also failed. So that posed um, people having to be deployed to uh, Miami. So here's uh, some statistics from Maria as it moved over uh, Puerto Rico. All of the islands were declared disaster areas by FEMA on October 2nd. There, were major dam there was major damage on the southeast portion of the island where it made landfall. The dome of the next rag was destroyed, as I showed you. Uh, the max wind gust measured on the in St. Croix and Culebra was 137 miles per hour. Almost half a million assistance applications from FEMA have been accepted with over a billion dollars in uh, support so far. Um, and there still to this day remains some controversy on the death count. Unfortunately, I don't want to provide you a number uh, with no certainty. Uh, but unfortunately, it's probably a pretty high number, but we'll have to wait on that um, to get the official number. So now I was deploying to Miami on September 24th to provide backup operations for San Juan as they were totally out in the dark. Uh, the forecast office is located in the National Hurricane Center and there you can see some damage actually from Irma just a little bit before that. Some of the reports as I landed for uh, backup operations, these are some of the status reports for the islands. The Guajataca Dam was um, possibly going to fail. There was a threat of dam failure the entire time I was there as the spillway uh, deteriorated. Some of the airports were open only for emergency purposes and almost half the island by the time I arrived there had no drinking water. And even though uh, the National Weather Service in San Juan was basically in the dark, several of their forecasters, actually all of them, were working day to day, several hours a day, staffing the EOC to provide decision support services and to work with us to, to provide a consistent message. So my duties backing up San Juan, uh, very challenging, obviously, as you can imagine, going into a new environment. Uh, three of us were deployed to do entire uh, or total backup operations, which included Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and the marine areas. We had to forecast the next seven days, which is standard at every weather service office. But unfortunately, we had very limited data with virtually no surface observations, as many of them have been destroyed. And also, I was using a lot of tools I was very unfamiliar with, so it was quite the learning curve going into this. We had eight aviation sites with no ground confirmation. One was in and out, but seven of them were permanently down, so we had no surface observations at those sites. We were also in charge of issuing watches and warnings, advisories and statements when any convection did threaten life or property, which was basically every day in the afternoon. Uh, so that was very difficult. We coordinated with the San Juan office continuously, you know, as there was communication, uh, primarily through NWS chat, to make sure that we had the same message as they were there on the ground working with some of the emergency management and other partners there. Another thing we had to do, which was uh, pretty stressful, we had to continue to request GO-16 mesoscale sectors. There are only two mesoscale sectors available which provide extra data um, down to one minute scans. Uh, unfortunately, we were at the mercy of 15 minute scans from GO-13, so it was essential and very critical that we have GO-16 mesoscale data uh, to provide warnings for them. Here's a picture of the potential failure of Guajataca Dam. This is a picture of the spillway. 
thankfully one of the residents there allowed us to, um, or not me, but allowed them on the ground to install a webcam. So because uh, the the failure was imminent any day, and we were ready to pull the, the plug on a emergency or a flash flood emergency uh, for that area. So it was very critical. Uh, there's a military helicopter transporting barriers to the, to the spillway to try to keep it from breaking away. I guess that was uh, more or less successful, and eventually uh, the dam did not fail. Here's a picture of operations from Miami. This is a picture of Christina from the NWS Corpus Christi office. She was one of the three also deployed. My workstation was over here, and in the background was Miami's forecast office. We were basically sharing operations as we were sending out products for two different offices here. Here's a picture of the aviation forecast points, eight in total. As you can see in green, that was the only one operating, and that was actually manual observations by those on the on the grounds. The ones that highlighted here in yellow, uh, those are two of the sites that are actually outside of the U.S. on the island of St. Kitts and St. Martin on the Dutch side, which was uh, practically destroyed after Irma. And here is a picture of uh, one of the active nights. We had a lot of nocturnal convection over the eastern half of Puerto Rico. Here's a picture of Warren Gen, which we used to issue warnings, advisories, and statements for those areas. It became very active this night, uh, and unfortunately, GO16 data was out right in the middle of this event uh, on an overnight shift, and I was using GO13 infrared satellite data um, to issue warnings with 15-minute scans. So four images per hour issuing warnings for uh, the people living here. Uh, VA case here, I had a flash flood warning out. And um, so obviously very critical that we have the best data available. Unfortunately, uh, I requested a rapid scan operations, which would allow us at least to get faster scans for our area. But there was a delay as there was, being, there was maintenance being done on the satellite. But eventually, GO16 data did eventually come back in late in the night, pretty much after the event was winding down. Um, and here I'm going to show a quick comparison of GO13 data. This is 15-minute scans. And obviously a little bit lower uh, spatial resolution as well. And here is a comparison with those 16 data, one minute, one minute images. As you can see, way more fluid, way more data, uh, a lot more useful for our operations, considering we had no radar imagery here. Here's another picture of one of the busiest days I had to work. I actually had a tornado report in San Juan about an hour after it had occurred. Uh, basically, I didn't really know what to do with satellite data and no uh, ground confirmation, but eventually there was a confirmation of a tornado, but very difficult to make a decision here when you're looking at satellite data and lightning. Um, but lightning did did help us a lot overlaying with satellite data. As you can see, very helpful uh, near the Guajataca Dam out here in northwestern Puerto Rico. We had a very strong storm develop, so we were able to let the ground crew know um, there, those that were doing search and rescue continuously after Maria had made landfall. Um, so, you know, there was some use to the lightning data overlaid with some of this GO-16 data. And there's a close-up of the storm as it moved offshore, developed into a strong MCS overnight, uh, negative 80 flood, or below negative 80 Celsius cloud tops, which are indicative of very strong updrafts as it moved offshore. Here's a picture of a local station in Puerto Rico broadcasting some of our hazards. I just thought this was interesting to show as um, I'm here issuing uh, products in Miami for Puerto Rico, and there's a local news station in Puerto Rico showing some of the flood advisories that I had out. And there's another image of the uh, MCS that was developing and moving offshore, had marine warnings all the way out to the, the end of their, uh, their forecast area. Here's a picture of a notepad. Uh, normally in an office when you're fully staffed during some of these events, you have more people um, keeping an eye on some of the expiration times, but when it was just me or one other forecaster, it was very difficult to keep track, so I just used the handy-dandy notepad and, and basically kept track of all of the products that were out. And this was one of the more challenging decisions I had to make. Uh, we actually had um, two meso sectors, one over Puerto Rico and one over Tropical Storm Nate, which was developing over Belize, the, uh, the country of Belize. Uh, the, the National Hurricane Center had walked over asking if there was potential for us to move the meso sector from Puerto Rico, but it just so happened that I had a flash flood watch out for that area, and we, we just simply can't rely on 15-minute satellite data to issue warnings. For, um, for those that are still in a humanitarian effort there on the island. So um, despite the Storm Prediction Center needing one of the other sectors, the National Hurricane Center gave up their sector and gave it to SPC and allowed us to keep ours to have uh, more 
high resolution data. So towards the end of my deployment in AWS Miami, uh, very strong convection all the way to my last day, uh, high impact event happening over the eastern portion of the, the island where most of the population is. Uh, but fortunately, I was able to take a quick break as I was about to leave and got a picture with Maria Torres, who used to work at the Brownsville office, and then Christina, who also uh, was deployed from Corpus Christi. Uh, towards the end of my deployment, I also had a visit from the Department of Commerce Secretary. So obviously I had to show this because I thought it was pretty cool. Um, it's very rare that you get to meet the Secretary um, of a department, which leads um, NOAA and the Weather Service. So he was able to come by and uh, see one of our special balloon releases, and I got to meet him very briefly um, before he headed out. And my last day, I flew out of Miami, headed back towards Brownsville, and I still can't avoid tropical cyclones. I actually had to go around Nate um, as I went along the southern coast, of, or the northern coast of, coast of the Gulf of Mexico. So that's about it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions once again, so um, I, I'm very... I